I did want to just mention for those who don't know me, uh, I am Jamie York. I've been teaching here in this school pretty much since 1994. Uh, there was a short time where I left the school. We moved to Holland in particular. I taught at a Waldorf school there, came back. Um, my background is actually very um, typical, I guess, very normal for this country in that I went to a, a public school in Connecticut, fairly large one, then I went to engineering school. And it wasn't until fairly late on that I discovered Waldorf education, again in uh, 1994 is when I first came here. Um, I do, I always feel this need to say, I'll say many things tonight, some of them might even be controversial, I hope a little bit thought-provoking. Maybe not so much with this lecture, honestly, because we'll be doing lots of fun things. But just to say that just because it comes out of my mouth doesn't mean that's, that, that is what Waldorf math is. Uh, to some degree, some of this is what I've come to after reading Rudolf Steiner, after thinking a lot um, about what a math curriculum could be in a Waldorf school. And honestly, I think there's a, high, there's a fine line between, and, and a blurry line, of what makes good math in a Waldorf school and what makes good math anywhere. And I, I do want to acknowledge that I'll, sometimes I will use the word mainstream. I don't mean that in any sort of bad way. It's just, I guess, when I mention that word, it's just what is typically going on, I guess, mostly in this country today regarding education. In this case, we're going to be talking about geometry quite a bit. Um, I do acknowledge that there are a lot of good teachers out there, not just within the Waldorf system, but really hardworking, good people in our public schools and other private schools in this country. Um, although I do really believe that Waldorf is special, and I'm hoping that what I'm going to do tonight will help to show you through experience really what makes Waldorf geometry different. The first time you ever walked into a Waldorf kindergarten, it's very striking, isn't it? You walk in and it's, and it's just for those of, you know, for someone like me who went to uh, a school where there wasn't that beauty that we were just surrounded by when we were younger in school, it was very striking. Um, and much of Waldorf education, you do get these visual impressions. It's very visible immediately, even in the upper grades, that it's a different education. Math can be an exception there. Because in mathematics, much of it isn't visible. It's happening in our heads, as it should. So this is one place within the realm of mathematics where that actually isn't true. And it's a very wonderful thing. You, we can see... And it's very clear that this is a place, very visibly apparent, where Waldorf education in, in the realm of mathematics is very different. And that's the whole geometry curriculum. I'd actually like to start to speak right now uh, about what is it that the normal experience for geometry actually is. I'm just going to talk about this for a few minutes here. So if we're talking about our mainstream geometry curriculum. What are typically the topics? What comes to mind? Theorems. theorems. OK. So we have theorems. Other ideas, just shapes. shapes. OK, proofs. Shapes, angles and formulas. Angles, what else? Uh, assumptions and postulates, that's within the realm of proofs and theorems for sure. What else would, did we do when we studied geometry in school? Measurement, Measurement absolutely. Um, I'm sure you've probably heard this idea that the word geometry is really the measurement of the earth, the physical world that we live in. So we have measurement, and through measurement, we can do various calculations. It ties into formulas. We have volumes, we have area, and many other kinds of measurement. What else in terms of geometry are we all used to normally? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's pretty much it, isn't it? Isn't that largely what our geometry experience was, pretty much? So in getting into shapes, they could be um, two-dimensional, three-dimensional. That's true. And what I want to draw attention to here is that for most all of us in our education, that what geometry really was, was not really geometry at all. What geometry really was, it was a platform or an excuse, if you will, to do something else that was actually quite useful and good. For instance, proofs and theorems. What are we doing here? What are we really doing when we do proofs and theorems? It's logic, isn't it? It's logic. We're working on logic. And that's a wonderful thing. I'll speak about that a little bit later in the evening. It's a very wonderful thing to do. But geometry is sort of the platform or it's the venue through which we're studying logic. We're not really in proofs and theorems. We're not really concentrating on the essence of geometry per se. Formulas, angles, measurement, volumes, all of these things really aren't they in the realm in some way or another of algebra? I mean, we're doing calculations, we're doing formulas, we're developing mathematical thinking. All of this is good. But I would say the one thing here that really stands out as being what I am going to call pure geometry is what I just circled, shapes. Isn't that the essence of what geometry really is? And so when we really talk about what I will say, what I'll call Waldorf geometry, I'll put that in quotes. We could also call it, sometimes it's called pure geometry or synthetic geometry. This is geometry, studying geometry just for the sake of studying form. It really is about shape, it's about form. It's about, as we'll learn tonight, transformation. It's not about measurement. Waldorf geometry often, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to insinuate that in a Waldorf school we don't do this. We do. But we do something extra as well. And this is really what makes Waldorf geometry very different. What else are we, it would be qualities or aspects of Waldorf geometry, would you think, that's emphasized that we normally wouldn't? Why would we teach this, do you think? Maybe something around space. Yeah. Okay. Relationships. Spatial. Did I spell that right? Yeah. Spatial, well, I'm going to bring in this word that I think is really important and largely misunderstood, imagination. We call it spatial imagination. This imagination, this ability to imagine, in this case, to imagine form. And what I'd like to emphasize more than anything is perhaps if there's one statement as a math teacher that's probably influenced my teaching in, the, in a Waldorf school more than any other. It's Rudolf Steiner when he says, whenever possible, imagine, have the students imagine geometric form in movement. Whenever possible, have the students imagine geometric form in movement. It's actually really powerful. And that's a big part of what I'm going to bring tonight, to really see this geometric form in movement. And so what I'm going to simply do is put my compass needle on every single one of these points on the circle and draw a new circle, but every single circle that I draw, compass needle in 20 different places, but every single circle must go through my special point. That's it. So I'll do a couple of them here. And by the way, oh, you know what? I have a word of advice. Let's do this first. Because I'll bet several of you have not used a compass in a while. 
So let's give a li let's do a little, in fact, you can take a blank sheet of paper and do practice with your compass. And that would just look like this. Here's my, here is my hint to you with compasses. First of all, never grab the lead, the arm, the leg of the compass that draws. Don't grab that ever. Sometimes I'll secure my compass with my left hand. I want to keep it there. I don't want it to jump around. And then what I will do, when I draw my circle, watch me here. When I draw the circle, I'll tilt the compass slightly in the direction that I'm drawing. Watch this. Tilt it slightly. And then I just go like this. Notice my hand, my right hand, and, and in fact, you have compasses, I think, pretty much have a little twirly thing. And so really, I'm going like this. I'm holding this. And then I just twirl. Sometimes when you're good, you don't even need to hold that. You just twirl. You just, so practice a couple circles on your blank piece of paper. And then once you're good, go back to this exercise for those who just arrived. I simply have a circle. This is the piece of paper called Limason. 20 points around the circle. And I put my compass needle. Don't start with the smallest ones. It's harder. So I'm going to put my compass needle, say, here. I adjust my compass so that it's going to go through the special point, And I draw a circle. And now I will simply do that again. So my compass needle is at each of the 20 points and see what you get. Every single new circle goes through the special point. The special point can be anywhere actually. Make it a little bit inside or a little bit outside the circle or on the edge of the circle would probably be best. So when you are done, and I'll give you a little bit of a clue here, for those people who chose their special point to be outside the circle, it actually will be a little bit different than this. But let me just watch this here. I will now shade in the outside form. If you could imagine this to be not 20 points I selected in the circle, but 2,000, it would then become much more clear and smooth. And this is called the limousine. Now, if you have a point outside the circle, what you are going to find is there will be a loop. Look for the loop, OK? So the loop meaning, instead of going like this and being a little bump, if your special point, here was mine here, in my original circle, of course, we can see from the 20 points. But if you had the point, your special point outside, and that point is called the cusp, then it'll go something like this. You follow this? There will be a loop, and it will loop in like that inside the circle. So look for that if your point happened to be outside the circle. So I'll just mention one more thing about this drawing, and that is when you shade in the outside, just look for the smooth form. So you're really going past the bumps. You're just touching the outside, not coming into at all anything that you've done. Just nice and smooth around like that. And if you could make that nice and dark, because I'd like to display a few up on the board here. Um, that would be nice. Nice and dark outline on the outside, so we can just show the differences here. And in fact, what I'm going to do right now is we're going to see a little bit of geometric form and movement, because I'm going to go around and take certain drawings. <coughs> Did anybody happen to take up the idea of the point on the circle? Oh, you have it on the circle? Fantastic. Very good. So I'm going to take Deb's right here. And Deb chose to have her limousine special point at the center. Let's take one where it's just a little bit, in, uh, little bit inside the circle. Anybody else have a bigger loop, a nice big loop to theirs that had a point on the outside of the circle? So here we are outside the circle. If you were to look at one of those drawings, would you think it would be so much more complicated to do it? And I think there's a beauty in that. The simplicity, the, law, the simple lawfulness of it, and out of this we can create a really beautiful form. This is something that's typically, that can be done in sixth grade, which I think is a wonderful exercise.